And uh, our next presentation is not whether, but how, reframing our relationship to the inevitable. And it's my privilege and pleasure. I can't get any louder without yelling at you. And I was told I shouldn't yell. Uh, any closer, I have to eat it. All right, please take your seats. So we can get started on time. Our next presentation by B.J. Miller is not whether but how refraining our relationship to the inevitable. You, I had the pleasure of hearing B.J. at the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. You may have seen his TED Talks. I have an extensive thing here to read, but I'm not going to because I think we just need to know him as B.J. and appreciate what he does. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, nice to see everybody. Nice to be back on home turf. Uh, a lot of you guys are probably at AHPM just recently too. Yeah. Uh, conference conference fatigue. Are everyone doing all right? I'm gonna do all right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So. There's a lot, I'm, I'm going to try to um, not drag on too long with the slides. And it's fun to be here because I know a lot of people, but the downside is Michael Fradkin and I were just talking about is that means a lot of you people in the audience have seen and heard what I'm about to say. So, sorry. Um, hopefully I'll find a new word here or there. Um, but anyway, nice to see everybody. I'm trying not to drone on too long so we can get to the Q&A stuff, which is the fun part. So uh, please uh, don't hold back if you have questions. And uh, like you guys, this is, uh, I'm here as a palliative care doctor, but as a patient, as a fellow human being. So uh, we can talk about just about anything. So, all right. Starting with the title, um, not whether but how. The reason I, I love that title, and I keep using this phrase because uh, the first time that phrase came up was clinically. I remember early on in, uh, in this work, uh, in my job, the feeling was that you had to convince people that they died. Like that there's some, <laughs> I know, it's ridiculous. Um, but that's, uh, that, you, that you had this outrageous thing to overcome, which was the blatant obvious, the blatantly obvious. Somehow was just not obvious. So in some ways, it feels like um, maybe uh, we're moving a little bit beyond that, that maybe we don't have to debate whether we die, but then we can get on to the more interesting question of how we die, where we die, when we die, the stuff we actually kind of care about or concern ourselves with. But then the phrase also um, has purchased two, as, as palliative care, as our field has arrived. So. Um, it used to be, well, whether palliative care was going to finally catch on, whether people were going to open their eyes and minds to this notion of taking care of people besides beyond the point of fixing them. Um, and now it seems, thanks to the work of the coalition and many others, palliative care is, is real. It has arrived in a lot of ways. I think we, this probably I should not jinx ourselves, but in some ways we can take for granted that our field has arrived on some level. So it's not whether we're going to get somewhere, it's, but now how are we going to make good on this opportunity? And so I think it's, it, it's, it's on us now in this room to sort of take the field. It used to be like, oh, palliative care is this thing. It's great. The world just needs more of it. I think that's true. And also I'm getting a little scared sometimes watching what palliative care is. It's grown. It's, not, it's, it's wobbly. And I don't think we can just rely on palliative care just being this fixed, static thing that just the world needs more of. I think we have to develop it further. Um, and there are all sorts of exciting frontiers that way. So, um, well, geez, we've gotten through one slide. So I don't know if we're going to get to that Q&A stuff. Um, OK. So the, just to frame us out a little bit, who, I'm assuming that everyone here in this room believes that maybe there's some uh, change in order, whether it's a social change, a cultural change, or the healthcare system needs to change. But does everyone, anyone want to argue with everything's just cool and we should keep doing everything that we're doing? No one? <laughs> Do you really? Ah. Do I, thank you. Do I move it up? 
Up. How's that? Any better? Good. I thought I had an ear infection. That was so. Um. OK. So right, so we all know, I think we all believe maybe that there's some change in order. Culture change is the way I like to put it. Um, a lot of people have taught me about palliative care and hospice work is uh, this came up at Zen Hospice a lot, that dying is not a medical event. And amen to that. Way more exciting and interesting than just a medical event. Um, it's a big human thing. Um, so that means that there are so many different angles into the work, too. But if we're going to be serious about change, about culture change, well, how are we going to do that? Um, so as far as I can tell, these would be the four sort of chunks that we'd all need to concern ourselves with, one way or another, as a field, as a society. One is the society, the demand side of the equation, the people, our patients. If we're going to be patient-centered, well, what do our patients want? And what about us as caregivers in that mix and family members, et cetera? So it seems like there's room for a lot more social engagement. Um, I've been in so many meetings where we've talked about patient-centered care, and there's no patient anywhere near the meeting. Uh, I mean, I do it all the time myself. It's kind of silly, but it happens all the time. So, so yes, we got to preach to the people, but we need to hear from the people. And by the way, we're people, too. We're patients, too. There needs to be room for all that. Uh, second bullet would be our workforce, so OK. We know the workforce isn't um, big enough. We, we know that. It's not just the size, though. It's um, the quality of it. And I think we all in this room would believe that the, the, this idea of doctor knows everything is crazy. So there's this enlightened foundation of palliative care of doctors, nurses, social workers, chaplains, volunteers, music thanatologists, et cetera. But if our subject is really the human condition and uh, quality of life and suffering, well, um, I think there's room for even more disciplines into this mix. Recently, we talked to the design world, the arts, architecture, law, you name it. So another way that we might expand would be through uh, the fields of relevance that we invite into the mix. I get really excited on that one. Uh, and the third would be policy. Of course, we need. Um, I don't want to touch politics necessarily right now, but boy, it's a huge piece of this puzzle, of course. And then finally, infrastructure. So the bricks and mortar, we need places besides an acute care hospital, a nursing home, and home. Um, but we need communications infrastructure. I think technology has a lot to, to offer, as long as we're using the technology and not vice versa. Um, so anyway, that's a sort of the frame of where I'm coming from. Um, and then today, um, I think we'll, the fun part would be to focus, I think, on two, two chunks in particular. Um, so all the ways we know that we can suffer, there are many. Um, I've snuck in uh, on the wheel of suffering, I've snuck in this logistical suffering thing on the bottom, because I think we need, we need to acknowledge that uh, was something that we all know, is that the system, as, as, as amazing as it can be to deliver care to people who need it, is also a source of pain and suffering, often enough, too often. And I think we need to name that, we need to own that. Uh, and the, the exciting part is to remind ourselves is that is the, uh, the system is the made up part. That's the invented part. So that's extra vexing that we've made up these things that don't work very well, but that great news is well, it's an invention, so we can reinvent it. We can make something better. So anyway, that's why I like to focus on uh, logistical suffering to frame us out. And then I'll go from there into this existential piece. So for me, the field where I'd love to see us develop even further is this thing we call existential distress, existential suffering. Um, we don't really spend much time on it. It's this diagnosis of exclusion. So once you've ruled out pain and depression, all the things that you can pathologize and treat, uh, whatever, if you're left with someone who's still uh, uncomfortable, you just call it existential suffering. And that's about as far as we've gotten as a field. In fact, I would imagine that most doctor visits, most clinical visits have at their root existential distress. I would imagine it is the number one diagnosis that we ever deal with ever all the time. And I don't just mean in palliative care, I mean in probably a surgeon's office too. Um, 
So those are two things I kind of, for me, that seems like part of our frontier. Um, so let's, let's spend a little time framing out this uh, logistical suffering piece, the systems issues. These slides are just sort of prompts. I have no answers. They're just sort of ways to find ourselves in the ball game together. So this is a, a painting by, I think his name's William Prosperi. He's a living, breathing contemporary artist. Uh, he does mostly portraiture. And this is called Ether Day. This is a painting of uh, a moment in 1846 in Boston where the first operation on our anesthesia happened. We could, we could put someone to sleep and do stuff to their body. And in this moment, this is a, from the next 150 years on, technology ruled the roost. Science and medicine were bedfellows. The scientific me method ruled the day. Um, and also this disjointed, this dismembered, you could, there's the person and there's the body. And somehow those two were different. Um, and look, there's proof. We've, anyone who's been in an operating room or on an operating table knows this to be true. And I think what's going on in terms of the systems issues is a nice reminder that um, you know, a lot of good, good, good has come from that technology uh, seduction. A lot of good. I don't think we need to throw it out the window, but I do think we're also now this, on a systems level back to some sort of reckoning with the fallout of that approach to care. I don't think everyone realized the insistence of suffering, the insistence of death. We could solve this problem or that problem, but we create new ones, we uncover new ones. There's just an insistence on it. So we, I think in sort of making suffering and death the enemy, we have to re change our relationship to suffering and death. So you could, I'm sure you guys, this language is familiar to us all, but I do think it's, it's really important. So I do think, again, we know healthcare is not filled with evil people. The system is created by and filled with people who really, really mean well, really working really, really hard. So it seems like so much of the problem is more of a design flaw rather than a personality flaw. And I think one way of looking at that would be this, this idea that we framed it around diseases instead of the people who inhabit the disease. And that seems subtle maybe, but a lot flows from that. And if we could really reorient as the subject matter as being humanity, um, then I think we'd find ourselves in a very different place, and doors would open to us differently. Um, okay, I think to start us off here, um, again, painfully obvious. I mean, illness, suffering, everyone does it, therefore it's normal. Um, but yet, we send signals to our patients and to each other that if you've strayed from this strange standard human being that doesn't really exist, you're somehow anomalous. And any of us who live with disabilities in this room have felt this all up and down, all throughout our lives. Even if we just don't look like that normal thing, whoever that normal thing is. And it's a real, it's a shame. And so one of the ways I think of our, I, I like this reminder that the, the, the constructs that we use to digest reality are not the same thing as the reality they're meant to help us digest. So in medicine we do this a lot with pathologizing. We pathologize it, call it a bad thing, then we go to war with that bad thing. And oftentimes that works, but when you don't win that war, then you're a loser. Um, and that stinks. That's a hard message to absorb. Or because some cell in my body went pathological, then I as a person am pathological. That's a, that sucks and unnecessary. So these are the ways we kind of keep the suffering on each other totally unnecessarily. And again, it's a framing issue, you could say a design issue. Um, okay, this, this slide, uh, this is California Healthcare Foundation data. We all probably know this data. My only point here is, by the way, is there still an echo? Is there, I don't know. Can I, is there anything I can do about that? No. Okay. My only point on this slide is, okay, um, if this, this is, the, the question California Healthcare Foundation asked several thousand Californians, like, what issues are important to you as you think about the end of life? The re what I want to call attention to here is how few of these things that the, the people are caring about have anything to do with medicine. So, I even chafe at the idea of palliative medicine. I mean, that's why I love the phrase palliative care. Palliative medicine's a piece of palliative care, but they're not one and the same. The medical science, the medical field has a lot to offer this, but 
not everything by a long, by a long shot. Um, so, point taken, I'm sure. Um, all right, different modes. So under the old way of thinking, disease the enemy, go to war with the disease, eradicate the disease. If you can't eradicate the disease, you say something like, I'm sorry, there's nothing more we can do. And essentially dispense with that person. They may, you may care about that person, but they're no longer relevant to you as a clinician. What, what a shame. What a horrible shame. And how much this damage we do to each other is a simple abandonment issue. Um, and I also, of course, feel for the clinicians because you don't have time. You're, you're, you're not given the time to care past a certain point. Uh, so it's complicated. But I think a lot of those, again, the sort of design prompts, acute care, great. But it, it, summons, it summons a different kind of energy, right? Let me get to this. So intervening, acute care, trauma, something's wrong. You've got to go in there. You've got to change it up. You've got to usurp mother nature. And hence, a hospital looks nothing like the outside world. It's filled with all sorts of things to suspend reality for a moment so that you have a chance to fix this or that. OK. Really powerful stuff in the ER and in the trauma operating room. And when it works, it's amazing. When it doesn't work, that's the problem. But in terms of us training and getting in the school of thought for this, there's a different muscle. When you're intervening in something, that's a different part of your brain. That's a different circuitry. It's a different muscle than supporting someone. Supporting someone's a longer game. It's on their terms. You're not the expert anymore. Um, it's just a very different muscle. And it's one that we haven't really traditionally taught very well. Um, it's something that we hope is absorbed by clinicians in the name of bedside manner or something else that's uh, you know, relegated to nicety, but not essential. I think for this new game that we're playing, it's essential. Um, so, but I just need to call it out as a different muscle, the different thing to train ourselves around. And we can't expect every, all clinicians to have every muscle working at all, all the time. There's plenty of room for pure technicians in medicine. But at least for us in the field, um, and beyond, this supportive muscle, that's our wheelhouse. Let me go back one to this idea of proportionality. So another theme here as we revisit the healthcare system would be get away, watch our own language, get away from the, um, the uh, sort of bipolar, yes, no, bimodal. It's on or off, it's black or white, it's, it's good or bad, it's, it's well, it's sick. The truth is, so much of the experience of life and illness are all in the shades of gray. Um, so we need to change up the way we think about that. We have to see things on a spectrum, not in opposition. It's not the medical model versus the social model versus the spiritual model. It's crazy. They're all in working in conjunction. They should. They could. And they're on a spectrum. So again, a different muscle. And from, for the guys who are doing research, it's you know, continuous variables instead of dichotomous variables. Um, okay, another way of saying much the same thing would be this idea of, of healing. So if we're, what's our goal in medicine? It has been to cure, pretty much, it seems. Maybe the better goal is healing. And one reason that's a better goal is that healing is always possible. You can be sick, you can be dying, and you can be well. You can be whole. You can be yourself, even though your body's failing. It's failing, right? So you can be, on, be beyond cure, but you're not, maybe never beyond the reach of healing. And the other thing that's so beautiful about that is healing really, we clinicians may be helpful as a guide or as a reflective device or just a kind, uh, a kind heart, um, but really healing is a, more an internal process, it seems. It's up to the patient in so many ways. It's not us as experts to bestow healing on somebody. So it changes up the power dynamic. Um, okay, health. So I, I hear us talk about health as though it's presumed as the goal. A phrase is like, if you have your health, you have everything. Um, bull shush. Bull shush. <laughs> uh, first of all, what the heck is health? Um, and why would you ever care to have your health? I would say so that you, on behalf of the quality of your life, I would like to have a body that's working well enough so that I can go navigate the planet and use, the, and use my life accordingly. 
It's not the other way around. I think the way we talk about it in palliative care and more in medicine is that it's the quality of life is the, is the consolation prize, is the second place finish. You can have your health, but we're going to go for a quality of life. Um, that seems, that seems the, the right to invert. Um, again, we're just sort of reframing re some stuff here. Um, okay. Okay. This one, uh, yeah. So, again, a fair amount of redundancy, but, uh, you know, when people come to us, so sufferings are, we're in, our goal is to mitigate suffering. That's a pretty profound and lofty goal, and it's a beautiful thing, and if we can do that, we've done a lot. <clears throat> but part and parcel, it also seems that we also, more than casually, should keep an eye out, especially as a system, to, to find a way to protect the idea that life could be even wonderful, not just less, not just not just uncrappy, less, less bad. Um, so again, not always possible, and you can't mandate joy and all this stuff, but you can at least keep an eye out for it, and you can make space for it. And it just seems like if we're going to be reconstructing the system, let's, let's aim a little higher. Okay, choice. Choice seems like a big deal, and I'm trying to think of... Uh, like a lot of us, I, I know, I spastically with patients will look for, to offer people choices because you, uh, in our, we inherit this idea that choice is freedom, freedom is good, and that sickness, death are anti-freedom. They're, they're robbing you of freedom. They're robbing you of choice. So anything we can do to um, counteract that, that theft is a good thing. So we offer up all sorts of choices. And I'm sure, I'm, I know I'm guilty of it, but a lot of our, um, we, it happens that we will often offer offer choices that aren't real. And I swear that's got to be a new negligence. That needs to be called out, especially if time is short, to be wasting people's time with half-truths and offering things that we know that is not in their best interest, but just to offer them, just to do them because we can. That's a, that's a negligence as far as I can tell. I think we need to kind of get a little stronger, more vehement around this. This is where it's... Uh, we in this field need to be a little bit more courageous calling that out. Um, so I love choice, but I, love, I, just, I particularly like it when it's real. And it's also worth saying, too, when you're exhausted as a patient, sometimes choice is the last thing you want, too. Uh, it's, just, it's just another thing to screw up. If I have a choice, that means I can get it right or I can get it wrong. And I don't think we need to be layering up I get excited about the, there's a blush of activity around our subject now, and tech is getting in, and there's innovation happening, and it's really exciting because there's certainly room for new thinking, new things, of new ways to do stuff. Uh, that's true. But I, I fear with, uh, that we're just loading up the pile of the to-do list for, the, for people who are dying, and that would be a shame, I think. So this one is just a placeholder for mystery. So if we're gonna, if we're gonna, if we're gonna, if we're gonna really retool this system, then we gotta revisit this idea of of, of not knowing. You know, as a, especially as a physician, I don't know, maybe in any clinic, clinical, maybe just as a human being, the, the the propensity to feel people are looking at you to know stuff, and if you so therefore saying I don't know seems like a real hazard. Um, in fact, from a patient's point of view, I'm sure we all know this. It, it actually can feel really good to hear that from your doctor. You can feel really sweet, because then you realize the doctor's not up here and you're not down here. You're kind of two humans trying to figure it out. And that can be a real, there can be a lot of therapy in that. I, I think we do also, back to politics for a split second, I think pretending to not know stuff that we know is also a hazard and a negligence. But being really honest before all that we don't know, I think, is, a, is not only essential just for some integrity, uh, but it's also wonderful. I think it's a very beautiful thing. And if we can be in touch with mystery, then we can be in touch with curiosity, and then we can stay open. And we can also think about it in our clinical encounters. And think about, I remember in fellowship being taught about this. You know, you, you think you inherit a patient, and you inherit a story with that patient. And you, before you've even met that patient, you feel like you know that patient, and you go in with judgments already at, you've, they're, you, they're, they're cooked. They, you, you, they cannot impress upon you who they are at that point. So this, this other relationship with not knowing, I like this reminder, is before we walk into patient encounters or meeting anybody, just to drop this idea that you know. You'll be so differently open to them, and I think we should do that with our patients a little bit more than we do. And I'm, again, I'm speaking to myself, basically. 
Um, okay, attention. All right, this one's a good one. Um, how the heck do we, so paying attention has become an endangered art. Uh, these little gizmos, these little suckers, these phones, it's, it's oh, anyway, um, you know, we all have them. Uh, I'm completely addicted to them. Um, I'm dependent upon it, et cetera, but my only point is it has become, the idea of just paying attention with an individual for any period of time, an eye contact, I mean, that has become a lost art, like it's a craft now. Um, so we as a field need to protect that. But I also, um, and it is a muscle, it's a skill. You cannot take that for granted. Um, so this is where meditation can come in handy. Um, but I also think of it in terms of redesigning the healthcare system that wouldn't it be nice, if, if any, anything built, anything created, if we built it so that it rewarded you for paying attention, the closer you looked, the, close, the, the, the more it rewarded you, in, instead of the opposite. Right now, things are designed to splash you in the eyeball and they really like feel indispensable, and that lasts maybe whatever, a, a day, a year, and then you throw it away. Um, this, so if we're going to redesigning a system, I would like us to invert that one too. The closer you pay attention, the more thoughtful it becomes, the more amazing it becomes. That it rewards you for paying attention. It will help exercise that muscle. All right. <clears throat> so those are sort of design cues for made from some theoretical, hypothetical redesign of the healthcare system. Um, this painting, I like. I love this painting. I, I use it a lot. Um, uh, by Nicholas Poussin, it's a 16th century painting called Et in Arcadia Ego. So by the way, I'm switching over to this existential plane now. So uh, we can't really tell, so this, this is, uh, so Et in Arcadia Ego is Latin for I, I too exist in paradise. Um, and the, the translation, there's a famous art history essay on this painting, and the translation of the I here is that the I is death. Because you see these guys wandering around paradise. They're in Arcadia. They're in heaven. And they come across a tomb. And they're looking at it inquisitively. inquisitively. And the guy's looking at the inscription which says at an Arcadia Ego on the tomb. And they're kind of wondering, what the heck is death doing in paradise? Isn't death maybe the opposite of paradise? But I guess what this painting calls to attention is, Actually, maybe death has a lot to do with how we experience paradise. Maybe death has a lot to do with how we experience anything. So if we're going to get into this existential plane, which has a lot to do, by the way, the existential plane, as far as I can tell, is basically if someone's having existential distress, it's a crisis of meaning. There's an absence of meaning. or The, the relationship to meaning is fraught, is somehow in peril. So if, if, if our subject is meaning now, what the heck makes meaning? What, what makes meaning have any meaning as a concept, except that it ends? So, and I like, I like to ask this question, how many people would, if you, you know, if you could push a button and live forever, how many, it's a dumb question, but let's ask it anyway, who, who, who would push it? How many would push the button? Two, <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you, very bold. Uh, and some, I mean, of course it matters. What world would you be living in, blah, blah, what age, you know, um, whatever. But the point is, we talk about death like it's this absolute enemy. We treat it as such. But mm, maybe not. Maybe at some point death is even welcome. And along the way, no matter what you feel about death, it is the agent that helps us experience anything being precious, anything being important, period, end of story. So it has a lot to do with how we experience paradise, I think. So that may be a beginning to how we get into this existential plane, which I think is really ripe for further development. Um, so I've said a little bit about meaning. Um, I, I, I don't know. I'll leave it up to you guys. I think some of us approach meaning as though it, is, it, it exists, and it's ours to find it. Um, it's our task to go find it and uncover, uncover meaning. Um, I think also, uh, or we humans, depending on your, your belief system, um, create meaning, that we are meaning-making machines. And I, I know that meaning can flow through us. We can, we can deem something meaningful with just, just, a, a, just our finger, just a thought. 
By the second we care about something, it is meaningful to us. We can place meaning. It's an amazing capacity we have as human beings. Um, so to call it out as essential is important. But the difference between meaning making and meaning finding, I think, is important because when you find people in a crisis of meaning, reminding them, reminding ourselves that we can, we can make it, we can create meaning, is empowering. And it, there, it becomes a creative enterprise. So one way into this existential stuff is, um, is, to, is, is to not separate ourselves from the subject. So I think this is really key, and one of the reasons why our field is unique is that everyone, if our subject matter is suffering and, de and death, um, everyone does it. Literally 100% of us do that. Uh, that means, that gives us, the groundwork for our field is therefore empathy. We have access to empathy because we all do what our patients are going through one way or another. You can, you, you know, in other fields in clinical medicine, um, think about I mean, how many orthopedic surgeons have never had their shoulder operated on or whatever else, or nephrologists who have never had dialysis, right? Not so in our field. And that, we should let that change our dynamic to our patients. A lot of, maybe scary, but a lot of good flows from this for us. And it means we don't just have to go learn stuff in a book. Part of our lesson in doing this work is to be our, to live our lives. Like, that's our homework, which is really exciting. Um, that's great. Just by doing, taking care of your business, staying inspired, loving the people you love, that's your, that's, that's your job, <laughs> um, which I think is wonderful. And I think we also, if we're not careful, we, we insert wedges that don't need to exist between ourselves and patients a lot, too. So I hear us in this rhetorical business about anytime you say the anything, fill in the blank, the poor, the dying. You're basically saying it's not me. And I understand, like, when we talk about the dying, normally I think what we're saying is there are people, patients, who are closer to death than we are. And they're not talking about it in this abstract way with a drink, uh, uh, you know, in a convention hall. Um, so, so, okay, kudos to the patients. We're not, we shouldn't just say, oh, I understand what it feels like to be dying. Um, but in some way we are dying, all of us. And I just think that that's a creative spark that we underutilize. Okay, so another way of saying this too, to sort of get at this, is this relationship between self and other. So in this existential plane, well, um, I think it's worth us mentioning this sort of a few of the um, impossibilities that we come across. Like uh, uh, autonomy is one. I'm not sure that exists. I think autonomy, independence, objectivity, these are, um, these are uh, idealized states that we can approach, but that we can never really attain. And I don't think autonomy really exists. I, there's a myth of independence. So you can spend a lot of time embiggening yourself as a way of dealing with your existential distress, but even people with the biggest selves come crashing down, and a lot of, you guys have some normal experience. I mean, in my experience, a lot of those guys who have really worked on the self uh, and have created this enormous self, it comes time to die. In some ways, it's harder. Maybe. It's like farther to fall, more to lose. Uh, and they've not done the work of seeing themselves in others. And we can make, lay groundwork for that through mere neurons and other, we can justify it. But we know this to be true. We, we affect each other. From little to big, we are ourselves are much, the sense of self actually can be and should be, I think, much more diffuse. And if you talk to older folks, and people who have suffered a lot, they tend to demonstrate that. The self has been spanked enough to say, okay, I get it, all right, I'm not alone. I'm a little, little thing in this planet. I'm all I have on some level, and that's great, the planet would be a different place without me, but I'm little. <laughs> and that's really wonderful. And you can start then linking your own fortunes and your own well-being to others. I know I'm preaching to a choir, a room filled with people who do this for a living, essentially, and have been called to this. But it's just, a, I think, an important thing to, to, to call out in the framework of existential distress. So getting your right-sizing your, your own sense of self and your problems in the mix. I, I guess I touched on this, too. I, th I don't think we give p impossibility enough credit. I mean, I, <laughs> there's some real power to impossibility. So if someone tells me, um, you know, if someone, I, I, I want to I fly to the moon, 
Well, that's not impossible. Let's see, let me think of something that's impossible. Um, I, wanna f I wanna fly to Mars. Someone says, that's not possible. I can dispense with that goal in about a millisecond. Oh, not possible. Bummer, but I'll move on. Um, there's some real potency to something actually being without reach, because then you're not tempted to try so hard, and not tempted to feel like a loser for not getting it. Um, so I, I, I've sort of touched on this around uh, choice. But we should let impossibility into the room when it's really into the room. There's a lot of relief there for us. Okay, and in terms of making meaning, am I gonna really save the world? Probably not. Um, if someone, you know, am I gonna live forever? And if I can call that a miracle, and I can call that impossible, then I don't expect it, all right? So a framing exercise for existential distress. Delight in things that are impossible. There's relief in it. Okay, this one I just, uh, I, I can't, this, uh, oh! I just, I love, I hate, words drive me nuts, we give them way too much power. Um, all up and down, because in just in terms of communicating with our patients, advanced directives, if they didn't state it, I mean, I'm a believer in advanced directives, but for God's sake, there are other ways of knowing. Patients with dementia can communicate with us, even if they've lost their language ca capacity. There are other ways of knowing, there are other ways of communicating. We need to give those some more credence. We give words so much power, so much potency, and they're such imperfect, imperfect little things. So just another framing exercise for existential distress. Flesh, the body. So what do we know about the body? The, I, I, the, um, depending on your belief system, you know, I worked at a place like Zen Hospice Project, and I would meet people who were, true, who were students of Buddhism, and um, we talked about, you know, no birth, no death, no beginning, no end. I, mean, I, I was interested to hear that, but I also don't necessarily, I think there's a, there's a problem with that when it comes to most of my patients. Um, so depending on what your belief system is, um, you may believe in an afterlife, but I think we can all agree in terms of finding our bearings, I think we can all agree that the, the, this body, the one that each of us inhabits now, this body will die, all right? So just to get our bearings, this body dies. Okay, that I can, that I can go with, and I can be open to other things, but this body will die. And the second point about this flesh thing is that the, what is flesh, what's interesting about having a body? Why, why do we, first, it, it, it moves us around the planet, like we said, but it also, it feels things. You know, how do you know when someone, know, you know, the phrase if someone, if you wonder if you're dreaming, you say, pinch me. You know, to feel something is what tells you you exist, that you are alive, that this isn't a dream. And I don't think we spend enough time on the body. Certainly in the hospital system, the body is this thing that is getting in the way. This body is this thing that is failing. This body is this thing that's a source of pain or misery or something else. Um, yeah, and let's not lose sight of all the joys that the body can be a source of too, and the sorrows that the body can inhabit, and the power of just feeling anything, I think is a real salve for existential distress. Um, I'm gonna come back to the body in a minute. Another thing along these lines too is the, 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 the relevance of just being for its own sake. You know, not doing, not the, uh, acquiring accomplishments. You know, at the end of a life, you don't review uh, the laundry list of things that were done. I hope that we think about how we affected each other and whether or not we were able to just sit in the majesty of being at all. I think about this for our patients uh, who, who talk about being a burden. So, uh, you know, it comes up on that slide from the California Healthcare Foundation. A lot of our concerns at the end of life, a lot of people who are uh, requesting aid in dying medication often come, comes down to this sort of aversion of this phrase, that they feel like they're a burden. So this, there's a lot to say about this one. But for one is, I think as a society, we got to really wake up on this. we got to really rethink this. We have this notion in America as a young society that our value, our worth, has to, has to do with our accomplishments, with what we do. Uh, with our productivity, and as soon as that we, our lives peak when that peaks, and then the rest of life is sort of slinking out of the way. And that's crazy, that's a shame, and it just it runs all over roughshod the, the power of just being, like we were talking about. But we also don't allow ourselves to repurpose. Um, you know, if you've had the same role in your life for much of your life, if you lose that role, you're kind of, you feel, that can, be a, that can be really, really hard, you can feel lost. So one response is for us to get better at helping each other repurpose, one, one response. Uh, second response would be get over it. 
<laughs> we are, like we said, none of us is independent. Um, there are times in your life where you're going to need more than you, to take more than you can give, and there are going to be times in your life where you can give more than you take, and that's just the ebb and flow of it. And if you want to focus on one half of that equation or the other, you are missing out on half, you are living half a life. This comes up with us clinicians all the time because we tend to make terrible patients because we think of ourselves as people who give care. We don't need care, we give care. That's a half, the, half the game. Uh, and if we don't learn to be loved, to be cared for, you really have lost, you, you haven't lived. And this is the power of sickness and being vulnerable. Any of us, I'm sure of us in the, all of us in this room have some experience with this. Um, so that's another sort of, this response to this being a burden um, is, is to get over it. Uh, and then the last thing is, I kind of touched upon this, um, is this idea of meaninglessness. And that's why I was getting into the flesh and the senses and feeling something and being for its own sake. It's not on behalf of anything else. I'm not uh, uh, walking to get somewhere. I'm walking to the joy of moving my body. I'm outside feeling sun on my skin, not to get my vitamin D levels up, just to feel the sun on my skin and the majesty is wacky. I'm al alive in this planet all by ourselves. And this, I mean, just let yourself delight in that. That's plenty. So yeah, meaning when you can make it, but I think the second half of the equation and purpose where you can find it but I think we also need to make space for meaninglessness and purposelessness. I think there's a real majesty in that, too. So there are a few more slides, but I realize that there's not much time left. So maybe I'll just pause there, because that's a sort of the overview from where I sit, sort of some themes to sort of re restructure maybe the systems issues, the, the stuff we can design. And then the other piece of this is this existential distressing, how we might reframe our relationship to meaning and meaninglessness. So that's, I'll stop there, but um, would love uh, questions or any conversation you'd like to have around it. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. And that is, I let miss the last phrase, and that is, uh, yeah, yes. So the woman in the front was pointing out that, uh, that being a burden, that having, living with illness is, is burdensome to you and to the people around you, the people who need to help take care of us, et cetera. So, and that is a legitimate issue, as you say. And I, and I wholeheartedly agree with you. And I, what I, the last thing I would want to do in that comment is to orphan, further orphan anyone for feeling a burden. It's, ex, it's real. My, my hope is that we as a society can aspire to, to revisit it, to understand the give and take of a life. So my own experience as when I was injured when I was 19, I, so for me the story was my friends and family rallied around in ways I could never have imagined and did not feel like I had earned in any way. And then I spent the next 11 years feeling really bad about how much I had taken from them and just didn't even want to bother even asking them about it because they had had to deal with so much in their college, the rest of their college time, et cetera. So I just, it was, I just, it was my 30th birthday and we all got together and we talked about it. And of course they just laughed at me. They said, you know, you idiot. Like, we didn't, it was not a tit for tat. We learned so much from your pain. We learned so much from helping you. So again, I, I want to be clear, there is a real burden to being, feeling a burden, and it's real. I just also want to call out the give and take of, of giving and taking, and the idea that we're all going to need help, and that we as a society might make a little bit more space for people who need, need more. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Thanks for calling that out, though. It's a really, I, I really struggle with this in our field of talking about the aspirations for the field without make, uh, orphaning this, the hard stuff. Yeah, we can make it better, but not always. And I don't want to make us feel like we're failing for not making it always better for everybody all the time. Thank you. 
What else? Yes, ma'am. Hello. My name is Serena Wright. Um, I'm here at, at really as a layperson. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. I'm not a social worker. Um, I don't know much about palliative care. I'm interested in death and dying. And I've had experiences in my own life which have brought me here. And it occurs to me as I listen, as I've been listening throughout the day, and this might be a question not just for you, but for the whole room, mm. is I feel like so much of the experience of death and dying does not happen in the medical world. It happens outside of the hospital and outside of the doctor's office visits and outside of social workers. And I'm looking for a way into this world that doesn't involve me going back and getting another degree. Mm -hmm. As a layperson, as what I am, and I feel like that's what I bring to this. And so I'm wondering if you have advice or guidance or direction to point me as I'm walking on my path. Great question, um, and right, because our subject, if we're really 100%, there's a relevance, there's relevance for all of us in this field, not just in our disciplines, our expertise. And, um, so it's a great question, it's a great, it's a great challenge. One question, one answer, come, and everyone jump in, but one, one answer that comes to mind, of course, is volunteering. So I was just talking to my friend Red Wing. I know it came up in her presentation earlier. Um, a place where I worked for years, the Zen Hospice Project, is built around the volunteer program. Um, and a lot of uh, old guard hospices were very much led by volunteers. Uh, and that's not just to save money. It's to make the point that this is a human experience. And we all bring something to the mix. So, so one answer, a straight ahead answer, would be to consider volunteering at a local hospice agency or a nursing home. Um, you know, so that's one idea. Another is um, to think about other parts of yourselves you, you could bring to the mix. So death cafes have sort of taken off, a way to convene people, to get people and engage the public, get people gathered around and talk about hard subjects. So hosting a death cafe is another way to do it. Um, you know, if you, wherever you work, maybe lobbying their HR department to have better uh, leave for family members who need to go help take care of somebody or to have better bereavement programs, make those part of the HR engine. So uh, those are a few ideas that come to mind as a ways to be involved as a non-professional. Um, anyone, I bet there are a gazillion ideas in this room for that. Um, I don't know if you'll be around. I will. OK, maybe come up here afterwards if there's anyone who wants to have a conversation. I, I'd love to keep talking about okay. that. But you also remind me of one thing I'd love to sort of, it's a tangent. But one of the things I want to call out about this existential uh, meaning the uh, existential distress piece. You know this weird tension in our field between the hospice end of life guys and the pad of care upstream guys, we're not supposed to say death. Um, that's a, a problem. And I've, I've really, I've watched us turn off, I was involved in some policy thing in DC and we were lobbying a senator for some policy thing and there was infighting whether we put the word hospice or palliative care first in the letter. You, and the senator could smell it, and he's like, you, guys, you come back to me when you get your own internal stuff worked out. It's like, whoa. So I just want to call, one of the reasons I love this existential piece, because everyone acknowledges the existential distress, even if you're nowhere near death, but because existential distress is framed around mortality, it's the way to sneak death into even the most upstream palliative care conversation. So that's my little tactic so that we can continue to describe and talk about the importance of death, even if you're working miles upstream in palliative care. Thank you, I just need to say that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay, yes, I'm just gonna mention um, with regard to the previous question, there's a program called Walk with Sally, and it's a mentoring program, so they match you um, with a child or a sibling um, who has another sibling going through cancer or a parent going through cancer, and if you've had an experience similar, they try to match you on that to um, build that bond. Mm. You guys not hear that? Or no? I can hear it. Okay. <laughs> could, so it's called Walk did you with Sally. Hear, yeah, do you want to, could you repeat the gist? Oh, Maybe oh, everyone so did. It's, um, it's a mentoring program. So they um, link the mentor and the child, so the sibling of um, someone who's going through cancer, or if they have a parent that's going through cancer, um, they link you together and you can do activities together. And um, it's just to build a relationship with, you know, if the mentor has gone through something similar. Mm. And your comments, thank you. And your comments also remind me another thing we can all do is the next time our neighbor or someone in our family or, some, or a stranger is suffering, has an illness, 
one thing we can all do sort of on behalf of this culture change, subtly sort of one person at a time, is just be really kind to that person. Don't run away from that person. And that's another way we can sort of grassroots shift this dial a little bit. So that's a volunteer effort. Um, okay. And we may be out of time. Are there any other, uh, any other questions or thoughts? Yes, ma'am. So, you guys hear that? So, the question is from a pediatrician in the audience. And by the way, th I, um, it's a great question. So the question is why pediatrics in the kids' world, you can have concurrent care. It's not this silly fork in the road of going for quality versus quantity of life. You can go on hospice or you can have other kinds of care. But pediatrics, like so much enlightenment in, in pediatrics. Uh, um, so for the adults, we're just not smart enough there yet. The policy is not in place yet. There are innovation. There are grants out there. There's, there, there are models being worked upon that would do this. I don't know where the legislation stands to actually get this into, into law and therefore into the insurance policy. Uh, I'm sure some people in this room have a, a bigger update on that front. Um, but we're working on it. I know that people who are advocating for the field are working on that. And that is the power of palliative care as, as, as not being limited by the language of hospice. That you can get around this six month idea and palliative care can be concurrent. Hospice can't though. So the question from Peter was about dignity, and this comes up a lot, the loss of dignity that we confront as we age or die or just deal with any illness. Um, so, I, you know, when I hear the word dignity, I mean, first of all, define dignity. It's another one of those words we all kind of have a sense of it, but I'm not sure how to define it. And I think that's the power. So when the word dignity comes up, what I hear, the translation for me is, that person wants to have a say in what's happening. You know, that, they wanted to be, have a say in their own life. That's, to me, that's the, the, the dignity is a proxy for that, that sense of things. So this idea, if we really move to a human or patient or person-centered model might help. We as a society, if we get, sort of revisit this idea of burden and being a burden and feeling a burden, I think that will also help. Um, I think also is for each of us, not overly forecasting what we're going to feel when we're in certain sets of shoes. So I think I, I, I talk to a lot of my patients about this. You know, by, when they're actually in the bed suffering from this or that or on their way towards death, if I ask them, when you were well, would you have ever imagined you could have handled this at all? And they say, no way. This happens in medicine, medicine all the time. And this is why medicine and disability rights have been sort of at odds. Doctors, there's a lot of data that suggests, like, Doctors, there was a study of ER doctors and nurses said, if you were brought into your own ER, a, a traumatic accident, and you were quadriplegic, and you were brought into your own ER, would you want your colleagues to, to revive you, help you live? 85% or something like that said, no way. I'm not, no way. I'm not. But you ask people who are actually quadriplegic, and they'll say, yeah, I'm really glad I'm alive. I could never have imagined dealing with this. But here I am, and I'm glad for it. So we also have to watch ourselves. We don't overly project. What, how we'll handle a situation before we're in it. If you'd ask me, well, if I take three of your limbs, are you going to be okay with that? I don't think I would, you know, I don't know, I know. <laughs> but now that I am, okay, you figure it out. So I think my answer to your question is there's a, there's a lot going on, there's a lot hiding behind this word dignity. Um, and it's an important question, but I think we're asking multiple questions with that question. Yes, ma'am. Do we still have time, guys? How are we doing? Yeah, good? Okay. I'd, I'd like to uh, clarify a little bit about the pediatric concurrent care. Mm. I'm Lori Butterworth, and I was part of the initial 
initiatives to begin that. And we fought very hard to remove that six-month death prognosis. That still exists in the pediatric model, where we're still talking about six months of life, which we need to get that piece removed and allow concurrent care as well. So to the woman who was here um, about what to do, grassroots advocacy, start things in the community. Mm. We need to have a groundswell of thinking around this to really change the thinking around quality of life and end of life and move that pediatric model that we have partially done to an adult model, but we still have a lot of work to do. So it's that grassroots community building that we need your help with. So wherever you are, I'd love to find you. Is there a resource online or some way we can tap into? Is there a Which petition to sign? Or? Uh, we'll, we're getting there. Uh, let's all start a, we'll start, we'll, we'll let you know. Okay. Yeah, I'll, cool. I'll um, I, this is Judy Thomas. I'm happy to give you an update. Thanks, Lori. Yeah. yeah. So a lot has happened in the pediatric world to allow for simultaneous care, but it's not flawless. It doesn't apply to every pediatric patient that could benefit from it. We don't have enough providers to meet the need. We have huge capacity issues. There's still lots of work to be done in that area. It is easier to make the case sympathetically that a parent should not have to choose to forego or to forego curative treatment because a child is always developing. So that's why, and there's fewer peds, pediatric patients out there. So that's why politically it was able to start there first. But that movement's not done yet, and the coalition with our work led by Deb and Dabs is really working to keep spreading that and making it bigger and not lose ground because we are at risk of losing ground hmm. for reasons that are beyond the obvious, which is the new administration is also huge. But the spread to the adult world is in SB 1004, the state legislation. It's not going to happen at the federal level or very quickly, probably even before this administration. And that's why the coalition is working with a collaboration of other organizations to keep SB 1004, which would mandate the managed, Medi-Cal managed care plans provide access to palliative care. Um, upstream for anybody who would benefit from it. And that's why we're also partnering with Blue Shield and starting this collaboration with multiple payers and multiple providers to spread palliative care up into the community and make it a standard that every, every plan, every provider, every, um, every one who pays for care is going to provide access to palliative care. So there's certainly, there's lots of work to be done. There's lots of things under the way happy to talk about if you want to get activated legislatively, know your legislator. Every legislator should know that you are in their district. They need to know that they have an expert in their local community that they can turn to to tell them the truth about the needs and the opportunities. And we have to increase capacity because we're going to get demand. Demand is already bigger than our capacity. So how do we increase capacity? So that when we, as we lay the foundation politically and with policy and with payment, that we have the people and the organizations that are ready to meet the needs of these patients. So it's, it's a long haul for this to mm -hmm. where we really want to be. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> and by the way, just to say on, on the heels of what Judy's comments, and, um, that's why I think it's really important that we continue to revisit our subject matter and not take, it's, it's huge and fascinating subject matter. And if we're trying to attract, stay in the game and attract others into it, I think it's really helpful for us to think creatively about how big and, and in some ways beautiful the subject is. Uh, so that's another reason to kind of keep pulling back and revisiting that, looking through the lens yet again and again and again. So that's There the, is one example of uh, concurrent adult care in which palliative care was started at the same time as chemotherapy for metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. And the outcome was the group getting palliative care and chemotherapy survived three months longer than the group just getting chemotherapy. Yeah, so right. So this idea, a lot of you guys probably know this data, there are there's there's growing data. It used to, I think, used to be like, well, sure, 
you might not live light, quite as long, but you'll have a better experience. But now we kind of link quality of life to actually living longer, which is a very beautiful linkage. Uh, any, uh, probably, oh. Um, so you, I love how you use art. I was an art history major too, mm -hmm. so. Um, but I'm wondering now, um, you know, as we really want to kind of transcend the conversation, I think art can be a really powerful tool to use. Mm -hmm. um, are there any particular artists or movements that, um, you know, could be inspiring and we could kind of get behind and change the conversation? So there was, and I don't know if there, there was, I think it's defunct, there was a Society for the Arts and Healthcare. I'm not sure if they exist anymore. I know there are a lot of individuals. There's a sound artist who came up through this open IDEO project in San Francisco, this woman named Yoko San. Do you know her work? So um, I think it's still at the level of individuals doing it. I don't know that there's any real organization yet around it. If anyone knows otherwise, please let me know. I'm, very, I'm very curious about that too. So there is actually a, a Pope Foundation in Canada, and Robert Pope was a young man who had leukemia. He was an artist. Mm. And he, did, he actually did paintings of his illness experience, and then his father, after he, he died his, of complications of his treatment, he was cured, but the treatment killed him, as we often see. And so he has a... Um, an art, pardon me, illness and healing, thank you. Mm. She's my brain, apparently. <laughs> There's a whole other story, we're not going to go there today. <laughs> anyway, so that's uh, really powerful uh, artwork as well. I want to take the opportunity to thank BJ for coming and sharing with us, really great, thank you. Thank you.